One thing that's, that follows quite critically from this is the fact that this system has to be net electroneutral. And because this system is net electroneutral, anytime we see a net charge in the fluid, here we see a net positive charge in the fluid related to a negatively charged wall. These charge densities all have to balance out. If I integrate all the net charge density in the electrical double layer, that should be exactly the opposite uh, of the net charge density at the wall. And we can relatively quickly identify a relation between phi naught and the aerial charge density, which I'll write as Q double prime. And we do that by basically by applying Maxwell's equations at the wall. So if we apply Gauss's law at the wall, In general, if we have a domain 1 and a domain 2 with a normal pointing in the direction from domain 1 to domain 2, we can write Gauss's law at the wall in this way. This basically says that the component of the electric displacement aligned normal to the wall the difference between the component of the electric displacement normal to the wall on side 1 and the same thing on side 2 must be explained by the presence of a net charge density. And in fact, this should look familiar to you. It should look similar to this expression. right? This expression is a bulk expression that says that the divergence of this electric displacement is related to a volumetric charge density. If I take that and I look at a control volume and I shrink it down to a wall, rather than getting the divergence of the electric displacement in a three-dimensional sense, I really get the difference between the electric displacements on the two sides, and that's what this is. And if I take the limit of the volumetric charge density as I take a control volume and make it an infinitely thin, flat pancake, now I get an aerial charge density. So this is really just Gauss's law shrunk down at an interface. And this says that well, whatever component of the electric displacement I have on one side, if that's different from the other side, it must be because there is a charge density at the interface. Now, if I assume that this interface is the interface between an insulating wall, like a piece of glass I use to make a microfluidic device, or a piece of plastic that I use to make a microfluidic device, everything becomes simpler because the electric field on this side goes to zero. And what that means is that I have a relation between the electric field on side 2 and the charge density. And I'm beginning to worry that I have a minus sign error, but we'll figure that out in a moment. So what this expression now tells us is that the derivative of the potential at the wall, and I'm doing this with respect to a normal dimension, so if I draw a flat surface like this, the normal direction is just y. The derivative of this is proportional to the charge density normalized by the permittivity. And so now let me see if I, in fact, have a minus sign error. So let's suppose I have a negatively charged wall. V is negative, the slope of that is positive, so d phi dn is positive, and my wall is negatively charged, which makes me think that I either wrote my Maxwell's equation boundary condition backwards, or I made a minus sign mistake. Give me a moment. Do you... I think I wrote my boundary condition wrong. 
The problem, yeah, Nicole. Uh, so the electric field in the glass, so it's not correct to say that the electric field has to be zero in glass, because of course uh, a dielectric can support an electric field. So I'm, I'm not saying that. Uh, instead, what I'm saying is that if I have a system that has both a, so actually let me let me back up and talk a little bit about electrostatics in the context of microfluidics and the presence of a of a lossy dielectric. So we have. When we talk about electrostatics, what we typically talk about are dielectrics and conductors. And when we do that, we basically say that, well, conductors don't support an electric field. So in a conductor, the electric field is uniform. And then we say dielectrics can support an electric field, and they're the ones that have, have a, an electric field in it. In fact, in microfluidics, what you're almost always dealing with is a lossy dielectric. It's never a pure conductor. It's never purely dielectric. So the relative behavior of the material surrounding your fluid and the fluid itself is governed by the fact that the fluid always has, a, or at least in most microfluidic devices, has a conductivity that's much, much, much higher than the, than the wall. So that means when you look at the electric field solution, the current is all carried through the lossy dielectric. It's always carried through the salty fluid. And your boundary conditions never end up prescribing an electric field in the dielectric. So the electric field that you observe in the dielectric always ends up going to zero. It's not forced to go to zero. Uh, like a dielectric can support an electric field. But if I have a piece of glass and salty water going through it and I connect two electrodes, my, the net solution will be that my electric field across the glass goes to zero. And so in the limit where you have an insulating material that's holding salty water, you'll find that the electric field in the, in the insulator is always zero. Does that help at all? Fantastic. OK, give me another 30 seconds to check my, the sign on my boundary condition, because I'm pretty sure I have it wrong. Look at me and the thing. And the, who wrote this book? God, there has to be a, a drawing somewhere with a normal. I remember I spent an entire year double checking the sign of the normal. E, yep, OK, I wrote it backwards. <coughs> Apologies for that. We can fix this very quickly. So all of these, one of the reasons why, I don't know about you, one of the reasons why I have trouble remembering these things is it's all arbitrary based on whether you have the normal point from 1 to 2 or don't. So I get this backwards. OK, so this means that, as I've described it, E1 is equal to 0. This is equal to 0, so I keep only that term. So it means I have this. Now, when I say that the electric field is the, uh, the opposite of the derivative, now a minus sign comes back in, and then I believe everything I have is correct. OK. Now, it turns out for the linearized solution, and also for the nonlinear solution, uh, but it's just not as easy to write, we have a, an expression for how much this is changing, right? We said that. Phi is given by phi naught times exponential of minus y over lambda d. If I take the derivative of this with respect to the normal direction, which is the y direction, I can now generate a simple expression for the derivative. I take d phi dy, and I just get the phi naught times minus y, sorry, times minus 1 over lambda d. Times this exponential. If I then evaluate this at y equals 0, I get minus phi naught over lambda d. And if I then plug that into that expression, I get that phi naught over lambda d is equal to q double prime over epsilon. And for fun, I'll put the epsilon over there. Do I have another minus sign error? Now I've confused myself. Do do do. I have this, and that's the minus, and then I have the minus. If I have, no, no, I'm sorry, this is right. Whew. 
so I have no minus sign, and that's consistent with the fact that if I have a negative surface charge, I have a negative potential at the wall. If I have a positive surface charge, I have a positive potential. So in this solution for the phi naught Q double prime relation, and this again is for phi naught much less than 1, because we've used the linearized relation. What this tells us is that if I specify the potential at the wall, the relation between that and the charge density that must have been there to generate this can be related to lambda d. If I, if I know the charge density and I want to estimate how big phi naught is, again, lambda d informs that. So for a given charge density, if my lambda d is really, really short, right? if I have a high ion density, lambda d is small, that also means that I'm not going to really get much potential difference out of this charge density. Lots of charge density and lots of shielding means that I'm going to get a small potential. If I don't have very much shielding, I don't have much concentration in the bulk, lambda d will be big, and a small charge density will give me a large interfacial potential. So this relation, which is just an implementation of Gauss's law for electricity, taken in the limit of the wall, and with the assumption that one of the sides of this interface is an insulator that has no electric charge, immediately tells me that I can relate the charge density that must be generating this potential difference to the potential difference itself and that relation is lambda d. This relation becomes more complicated in the case where uh, we have to involve the nonlinear form of the equation, and in that case we just use Graham's equation, which we'll talk about as the term goes by.